Welcome to another edition of the Voice of Palestine, Voice of the Palestinian People. It's April 11th, 2013, and I'm your co-host, Hanna Kawas. This week, we'll be talking with Palestinian-American author and activist Suzanne Abulhawa about the 11th anniversary of the Israeli assault on the Jenin refugee camp and her book, Mornings in Jenin. Susan is also a contributor to the book Searching Jenin and the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine. Good afternoon to you, Susan, and welcome to the Voice of Palestine. Thank you, Hannah. You know, I, I'd like to start with, because uh, two days ago, uh, April 9th, was the anniversary, 65th anniversary to be exact, of the Deir Yassin massacre. Uh, you know, it happened uh, under the British mandate, before the British left, also under the British mandate, half of the Palestinian refugees were expelled. So I think, uh, to, to me, my thinking, the British government is responsible for these atrocities, not the Zionist gang. I mean, they carry the main responsibility, but it was under their watch, and they were supposed to stop these uh, uh, infamies that were taking place under, under their watchful eyes. They, they were mandated to protect the civilian population and uh, quote, to quote them to civilize us, <laughs> but instead they gave away our land. So what memories you have for uh, the Deir Yassin massacre? I mean, certainly the, um, uh, the Brits share um, responsibility, not just for not stopping um, the atrocities, but for um, actively arming Zionist gangs for years and also encouraging um, Zionist immigration on their watch. So um, they, they bear a lot more responsibility than what you mentioned. Um, and this was, Deir Yassin was um, a really decisive massacre. Uh, it was something, it, it, it sent terror um, across the country. And I think, uh, uh, you know, the, what was said that it allowed um, mm -hmm. Israel to advance like a warm knife through butter, I believe is the quote, mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is really true. People were terrified after that when, um, you know, images and stories of women and children and men, old and young alike, were just butchered in their homes um, by, by Zionist thugs. So... Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I, th I believe uh, uh, Begin said without Deir Yassin, uh, yeah. Israel won't have been established. Um, you know, it's, it's through terror and such a thing that happened uh, in Deir Yassin. Although, you know, I, I just want to jump to... Um, to the uh, events uh, that took place again uh, on the, uh, I believe it started uh, uh, in, on the 2nd or 3rd of April and the massacre finished uh, around this time, 11th or 12th of April in uh, 2002 in Jenin. But I, I'd like to draw some comparison uh, there. You know, uh, the, in uh, Deir Yassin, uh, they really inflated the casualties. Uh, while at the massacre at Jenin, the Zionists tried to downplay the casualties. Why do you think uh, uh, they did that? Well, I mean, uh, they're, they're two different times, um, and they had two different purposes. Um, the massacre at Deir Yassin uh, was meant to... Um, uh, you know, they, they used that to terrorize the rest of the nation so that they could um, take over the country and, and, um, and occupy it. In Janine, um, there was, uh, there, there's, you know, the world um, was a bit further from uh, their guilt of, of the Holocaust, and, um, uh, and, and uh, people are willing to be a bit more critical of Israeli atrocities. And so Israel, um, you know, fights for its image now. Um, it's, you know, one of its biggest, um, uh, biggest projects is, is a Hasbara project that, uh, that aims to cover up 
um, the crimes that it commits with impunity, mm. with uh, with propaganda. You know, the only democracy in the Middle East. Yeah, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and this this kind of um, <clears throat> whitewashing and pinkwashing and greenwashing that goes on. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good observation, a good point that you make. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Because you know, I think uh, uh, we were monitoring the situation in 2002, and I'd like to uh, ask you also about your experience because you were there when it happened. But here we were monitoring the situation after the attack, Al Muqata'a, and uh, uh, attack the Nativity Church and all the major towns and cities. But the first uh, news item that came on the wire or through the internet also, was, uh, uh, you know, that uh, Shem'un Perez, who used to be the foreign minister of Israel, they were in a coalition government, uh, mm-hmm. stated, and this was reported by the Jerusalem Post and by Haaretz, not just by one uh, Israeli paper, that he called it a massacre. And then after that, they start the Hasbara, you know, uh, activity to suppress the the uh, or the extent of the massacre there in Jenin, and there were reports that they were moving even bodies to other locations. But from your experience, uh, and I'm not going to argue really whether it was a massacre or not, because uh, killing 50 <laughs> to me is, is a big massacre, you know. But again, uh, you know, they, they chose to say, the, especially the human rights group, you know, Amnesty International, that they committed the war crimes, you know, as if war crimes is less than a massacre. I don't know how they define these things. But you, yeah, I think there, I think there are um, legal implications to mm-hmm. the words um, war crime versus massacre versus uh, crimes against humanity, mm-hmm. uh, with crimes against humanity, I think, being the um, one of the more egregious. But, you know, I'm, I'm, not, a, yeah. I'm not a legal scholar, but um, that's my understanding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, could you tell us about your experience there? I, I believe you were there. Could you tell us yeah. uh, when when you were? I, well, I, initially I was um, uh, I was actually part of the a group that went to um, Al Muqata. One of the you know there, at first there was the initial group that went in, um, and they this was the beginning of the international solidarity movement. They literally just walked into. Um, <clears throat> The, they they just walked in and the Israeli uh, Israelis the soldiers were just kind of stunned and they weren't sure how to react they were completely unprepared for it um, but then um, the next time you know no one else was allowed to go in and they had uh, they set up you know uh, people uh, soldiers along the perimeter to not allow others to go in. Um, but there had been, you know, reports that there were some um, people in need of medical care inside, et cetera. So um, I was part of the group that that um, was trying to go in a um, uh, second try. So what we had, um, so what we did was to split up into two groups. Um, one would try to enter from one side while. Um, to create a diversion while another group could um, could you know could could go in from another side um, and that's exactly what happened I was part of the diversion group and, <clears throat> mm-hmm. and which allowed the, others the Israelis um, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so after that I went to um, I went to Janine uh, and I was among the some of the the one of the first international eyewitnesses to what happened um, and it, what was interesting to me and actually quite shocking was the uh, the to- the absence of of international bodies i mean the only uh, the <laughs> mm-hmm. the only non Palestinians I saw there were um, was a uh, a small delegation. Well, no, two. There was uh, there was a small delegation that was kind of being um, that was walking around, being led around by um, uh, by by one person from the Red Cross. This was the only Red Cross person that I saw. And then there was another Norwegian task force um, that was actually there to help. They had brought. Um, a specialized team and equipment that could um, detect 
um, people who who were trapped underground because Israel had demolished, literally gone through destroying homes with people still inside of them, and they there was thought that there were people still alive under the ground, and so that necessitated specialized equipment to um, to try and listen for sounds uh, because you don't want to start digging and then cause something to collapse and kill somebody who might be alive or something. So those were the only um, international people that I saw. Otherwise, it was just people like me and volunteers for the Red Crescent who were literally just digging bodies out um, day and night. Um, I personally participated um, in, in removing three bodies. Um, one was of a decomposed young man. Um, and there were two more. Was um, uh, one was a, an elderly man um, who, uh, w- with his grand, was what turned out to be his granddaughter, um, was a, a young child. Looked like she was maybe four years old or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I I, uh, I witnessed, of course, the mass grave. Um, and there were reports of um, prior to us getting there. I heard I heard this from enough people uh, of Israelis, you know, going through um, removing bodies and trucks. And there were a lot of people that remained unaccounted for and and uh, mm-hmm. um, and continued to be missing. So and 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 you said it. I mean, it's you know, it's a massacre. And and you know, I think that. The people, the, the young men who fought there were extraordinarily brave. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, all of them understood. I mean, these were young men with their whole lives ahead of them. And um, and every one of them, I think, understood that um, this was going to be, you know, uh, this was the end of their lives, their young lives. And, and they, they all fought. They all stayed and fought and um, until until they were, until their last breath, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, um, it's worth noting that uh, uh, all of these young men were born under occupation. And, uh, exactly. Yeah, and, uh, you know, they, they, they witnessed it's a reaction. I don't know if you've seen the CPT report about uh, the way the Israeli soldiers treat uh, young uh, uh, children, actually, not just young people, but children. There was a report today, uh, and it's disgraceful, really. And what do they expect from these children reaction in five, ten years when they grow up? So again, these are the same kind of children that fought the fought the Israelis and uh, told them, you know, uh, enough is enough. We are standing uh, to protect ourselves and our camp. Uh, could you tell us what day what, what date was that when you entered the camp? Because there is reports that uh, Israel tried to cover up the massacre by not allowing anybody in for at least four or five days. Is, am I correct? They didn't allow people in for at least a week and a half, if not two weeks. Yeah. So the camp was closed. I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to get in. Um, uh, I had tried once and I couldn't get in. And then mm-hmm. um, that was when I went back to Ramallah and then I went back up and I met some people in uh, in, a, in a town called Taybe. There's a couple of Taybes in Palestine, but this is the Taybe that's uh, yes. that's near Janine, just on the outskirts. And um, uh, so I stayed with them, and their son was a uh, cab driver who was finally able to get me in, and and it was quite a, a dangerous and and um, scary path that we took. But um, I did get in, and uh, and, and Israel opened, um, quote unquote, opened officially the camp um, the next day. So. Um, yeah, but that I, I, I meant really. Yeah. So, so when I was there, when I was walking around, that was supposedly when the camp had been opened. Yeah. Um, to, Which is the 16, maybe. Uh, I don't. Re- I, I don't uh, honestly don't remember yeah, the exact yeah. date. Yeah. Um, okay. But 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 I do recall that. Um, 
I was I was there at the beginning when they opened the camp at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. because the reports that after the massacre was finished on the 11th, uh, they didn't open the camp till uh, the 16th or something like that of uh, April. Uh, but it's clearly, you know, they they had something to hide. I mean, they closed the whole camp uh, as you said for almost two weeks. So obviously they were uh, trying to hide something, or else why why? Oh, of course. I mean, and. Even even, <laughs> even um, I mean, uh, so there, you know, when I was talking to people, that uh, pe- a lot of families had said that soldiers, like after they had entered the camp, um, were going around to homes and, um, uh, you know, people didn't have food and and they, they were they were they didn't have water either. So um, soldiers would go into the homes and find whatever food they had left and or bread, and they would just put it in a pile and pee on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know they were just urinating in people's yeah. houses and stuff. And then, um, and I, I have like actually a lot of video footage of of um, <clears throat> mm-hmm. of the mosque uh, and um, uh, in that one particular in one particular area in in, in the camp um, where soldiers had defecated all over the mosque and they had used it, they had used um, pages from the Quran to to wipe themselves. Um, they they had they just destroyed like this nursery and and there was like a mural that had been drawn it looked like by by children and they were just mm-hmm. this defaced it and just wrote the most vile ugly things um, all throughout the mosque it was just mm-hmm. it was it, there were acts of just random intense hatred uh, and um, you know of course later. Uh, there were a lot of a lot of stories came out. One of them that I recall was um, one of the guys, one of the soldiers who was driving the the big bulldozer that that buried a lot of people inside their homes was um, apparently had been drinking and um, put a the Bitar flag. It's, it's one of Israel's. Um, uh, football teams that are quite notoriously racist put the guitar flag on his on his bulldozer and was kind of going through saying oh I'm doing them a favor I'm creating a football field for them or something um, so it was kind of like this fun adventure for him mm-hmm. yeah. um, yeah, it, it sounds to me like a, a, a neo-fascist culture, really, because to 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 really uh, be so sadistic about uh, what they're doing to other people is really you can't be described other than new uh, new fascist. But uh, you know, uh, I know you're not keen on these uh, um, uh, terms, but uh, you know. Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. I I agree. I I'm, I I don't shy away from that at all because yeah. I think it's true and. And, um, yeah. uh, you know, I think a lot of people are hesitant to mm-hmm. to call to call it by its by its real name, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, but but it is. And I mean, if you look at um, especially some of the more recent reports that have been published on electronic intifada, I mean, it'll show you like the culture within the Israeli military um, and the, the level of hatred and um, that. You know, the the things that people, that these soldiers post, like, on their Twitter feeds, their Instagram um, and and Facebook pages are Mm -hmm. really betray a a pretty um, deep racism um, and hatred for for, for Palestinians. And, I mean, this is is not benign, of course. These are the people holding guns to our heads constantly. Yeah, yeah. And it's grown out of a a culture, the Zionist culture, that uh, thinks they are superior, basically. The same culture as the Nazis, really. They thought we, they think that we are uh, subhumans, uh, and that's why they do what they do to us. And uh, uh, they, they have have a license from God to do that, I guess. Well, I mean, this is kind of, um, you know, I think ultimately, um, you know, there are no eternal victims and there are are no eternal monsters either. Um, mm-hmm. And it seems human beings are quite prone to this kind of um, this kind of fascism and and mm-hmm. uh, sense of superiority and so forth. Um, and of course. 
you know, Jews, Israelis, no one, no one is immune to it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been, you know, it, this kind of stuff has occurred throughout history. Yeah. And, um, and it's principally born from people who, uh, who feel entitled to take what belongs to someone else. And um, and to do that, usually they employ, um, well, they invoke God <laughs> to yeah. be on their side, and and then proceed to employ the most savage violence against, um, you know, the indigenous inhabitants. And this is no exception. Mm -hmm. um, it is absolutely no exception. And and I'm um, you know I'm tired of mm -hmm. um, of hearing the kind of language that that makes this out to be as if it were a conflict between two equal parties who just don't agree yeah. when in fact i mean this is these are these are colonial settlers mm -hmm. european primarily but also american and 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 people from co coming from all over the world who feel that they are entitled mm -hmm. by by virtue of being Jewish to take what belongs to the indigenous population of that land. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, at some point, uh, it, you know, enough is enough. I mean, uh, you know, there's yeah. <laughs> the world countries sign these treaties and they ratify these human rights mm -hmm. um, conventions and, and so forth. And, and, uh, yes. uh, and, and they're applied to some people and and not for others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, all we're really asking is equality, and uh, you know that's uh, basic human rights. But before to get into the solution and uh, other things, you know, and uh, you know what's are our demands and uh, how we should solve the situation in uh, Palestine, uh, I'd like to ask you about your book, Mornings in Jenin. Uh, you wrote it as a novel, but it's really uh, the the historic. Uh, documentation is clearly uh, historic, you know, and uh, nobody could argue with the with the events that uh, took place uh, uh, during this novel that you wrote. Could you tell us a bit about it and how it came uh, about, and uh, also how people can get this book? Um, well, it's it's available for anybody who who wants to um, to read it. It's been published in 33 different languages, and um, you know it's readily available in any bookstore or Amazon or etc. Anything online. Um, it's uh, it's it's a novel. Um, it's a historic novel, which means that it's um, uh, you know the historic context is. Um, factual. Is factual and actual, but um, the characters are fictitious. And um, e you know, in my view, it is—it's a love story um, on many levels. Uh, and um, but but uh, the backdrop is our history, and so it follows. Um, the story follows four generations of one Palestinian family um, from uh, historic Palestine to Janine. Um, and of course, I, you know, part of my um, inspiration were the were the people of Janine. What that I the things that I witnessed there and their strength and their resolve and their love um, and their kindness and tenderness. Um, that was something that really has has continued to stay with me. Um, all these years, and uh, and that was the reason that I had uh, much of the book set in Janine. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's the story. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, also you you have a project called Playgrounds for Palestine that's I believe started in 2002. That's that's a, uh, you know. Uh, uh, parallel to the time you were uh, there. Uh, how did the idea came about, and is it still going? There? Is this project still going on? Yeah. Um, Players for Palestine started in 2001. Um, I uh, conceived of the idea after I went um, back to Palestine. I'd been gone for about 19 years, and um, my daughter was quite young at the time, and uh, playgrounds had been a really big part of our lives, you know, here in the U.S. And, mm -hmm. and the absence of playgrounds there was um, 
you know, was, was glaringly apparent to me. So uh, I came back and um, uh, and just started to start playgrounds for Palestine. And every every year uh, we we build um, playgrounds there. We just it's an all volunteer group. Um, no, we don't have a paid staff. This is a labor of love for all of us. It's uh, we're a board of uh, six women, mm-hmm. um, with various backgrounds, nationalities, religions. We're all based here in the U.S. and um, and uh, whatever we whatever money we raise, we use to uh, construct playgrounds for, especially in in areas um, where you know that that communities that are in in great need. Mm-hmm. Do you have a website uh, for for the, the playground? Yeah, it's uh, playgroundsforpalestine.org. Dot org, and people could donate uh, online. Absolutely, yeah. That will be great. We encourage our listeners to really uh, be generous and donate to this project because, like you said, it's important that at least uh, uh, the children uh, will have some uh, sense of normalcy, although this is (laughs) unheard under occupation. But, uh, again, you know, I think it helps a bit. Uh, You know, uh, I'd like also to, you know, ask you about... About, uh, what do you think as a Palestinian? What's the solution? Obviously, the Oslo was dead since it started. Uh, but what, what uh, you know, uh, can we do as uh, people in uh, Shitat, in diaspora, to uh, help our cause, basically? Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, there's a lot that people can do, um, and I think that, uh, unfortunately, um, not enough is being done. And, I, I, you know, there's, we're such a fragmented society at the moment. Um, you know, partly it has to do with, the, with you know, the tremendous geographic um, fragmentation of our society that's resulted from, uh, you know, from, from the colonization of Palestine and breaking it up, and and um, and having people sort of shatter and scatter all over the world in search of you know search of a living. Um, but you know, one thing I've noticed in this country, there's such a fear um, mm-hmm. of uh, of of saying anything, um, and that's unfortunate. Um, it, it's. <laughs> You know, we're we're an indigenous population that's been disinherited and dispossessed and robbed of everything. We have every right to be angry and and indignant. And you know, the moral high ground is with us. And no one should shy away from mm-hmm. uh, from speaking that truth. At a minimum, speaking it. Um, you know, I think it's also important to um to educate not just the people around us but ourselves i've been um amazed by the number of palestinians who don't know our own history mm-hmm. who don't know enough who don't even know uh what Dar Yassin was <laughs> you know or 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 janine or so even yeah even yeah we're doing mm-hmm. um a great disservice, I think, to ourselves and our society by not educating our kids. Um, and I think, um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of Palestinians in the Shatat have done quite well for themselves financially, and yet um, there's there's such a reluctance to contribute um, to, uh, to to Palestinians, especially. You know, and where, where Palestinians do contribute, mm-hmm. they, they 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 make sure it's just it has to be like humanitarian, or it's just this fear, this fear that pervades everything that people do. Um, you know, we have every right to organize politically. We, I mean, we have a right to do that. It's not illegal. It's not. But um, you know, I'm I'm a little. The, the the reluctance is demoralizing sometimes. Yeah. Um, but, but, but you know that's not true across the board. Of course, there are a lot of people who um, who continue to be politically active, who who give of their time, of their of their money, um, of their heart, 
and uh, you know, and there have even been a lot of, this happens quite a bit after, you know, the ill-fated Oslo, that Palestinians actually go back there and mm-hmm. um, build institutions. I mean, that's hugely um, admirable, I think, especially the ones who have resources and who've done well in the Shatat to go back and, and invest that money in our society there. Um, but at a minimum, I think that um, there needs to be greater investment um, in us organizing politically in the Shatat, because at the moment, you know, Abbas doesn't represent us. He, he, was, he wasn't even, he doesn't even represent Palestinians under occupation, yeah. frankly. He, he's not elected. He wasn't elected. Yeah, he, he, was, and, he was elected for one term. He's serving his third term without elections. <laughs> look, he, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's not... He's not a legitimate representative. That's true. That's um, true. He's not been empowered. And I think we've, that's already been established legally. Um, you know, it was, uh, and, and it's unfortunate. But in any event, even when he was um, there uh, legitimately, as legitimate, you know, mm. I say that in quote marks, it, you know, it, he only represented a tiny portion yes. of of the Palestinian society. I mean, we are, we are, Palestinian society is, is more than just the, the Palestinians who live under occupation. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's a whole Palestinian population that is, that's suffocating in refugee camps yeah. in, in, in Lebanon and Syria and Yanni, and now they're in the, the ones who are in Syria and then in Iraq are, are being are made yeah. refugees once again. So, not to forget you know, <laughs> Not to yeah, but on the come on. Yeah, I mean, this is a huge, huge um, sector of Palestinian society that's completely unrepresented. Mm-hmm. And there's also um, uh, Palestinians like us in, in in other countries who other in non-Arab countries who um, are just as legitimately part, of, you know, Palestinian yeah. as anyone else. And of course, and you know, and let's not forget the 1948 Palestinians. I mean, they are. Um, you know, I think it's unfortunate that they sort of sometimes get cut out of the equation because they hold Israeli citizenship. But the truth is, you know, they're the ones who stayed, and they their their presence in our in our homeland is is what proved the lie of a land without a people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that they, you know, Palestinians. Um, suffer from this chronic, you know, <laughs> division. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, but ultimately, you know, we are one society. Yeah. Um, we are divided by uh, geographically, of course, but and also by the different kinds of challenges that we face. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but ultimately, we all want the same thing, and we are all part of the same society, and, um, and, mm-hmm. and there needs to be some kind of representation for that. And um, <clears throat> at some point, I think, on some level, I, you know, th- there has to be some kind of uh, yeah. representation organized outside of Palestine for Palestinians. Yeah. And do you think, you know, the framework should stay the PLO? Because really the PLO is finished now without the charter. They annulled the charter and, uh, uh, you know, the charter as it is needs to be amended. You think the solution is through a PLO or through a new mass organization that will encompass everybody all over the world? Um, You know, I'm not going to dismiss the PLO. Um, but uh, frankly, it's you know uh, the lines between the PLO and the Palestinian Authority are, to me, are very blurry, and um, uh, you know there's there, there's not a clear demarcation. Um, but in any event, uh, I think that a new generation has to be included, and it has to. Um, uh, the representation of Palestinians has to has to widen, and it has to be inclusive of all sectors of Palestinian society, um, and and uh, it needs to sort of um, uh, evolve from uh, from the male domination as well. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's just, it's a different time. Um, there are different challenges, and there there's there are new Palestinian leaders and activists who have um, demonstrated and proved their ability to be leaders, yeah. and they, they, they need to be given platforms. And um, 
Yeah. And, uh, and roles to help move us forward. And these are not the ones that the PA is seeking anyway. <laughs> they, 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 anybody that thinks they don't want them, they want puppets really uh, to follow and to... Yeah, well, you know, there people are, you know, those people are either <laughs> are being arrested by Israel, they're being assassinated, mm-hmm. um, or they're being assassinated outside of Palestine. Um, I was just actually, before you called, I was reading an article about a, a young man in Hebron uh, who's a youth organizer who was just arrested. I mean, it's, <clears throat> you know, there's the old joke <laughs> that the, <laughs> the, the real Palestinian leaders are either dead or, or, in, or in Israeli jails. <laughs> I yeah, think yeah. sometimes there's probably some truth to that. Actually, I, I just put in my Facebook, you know, in response to the report that they uh, arrested 20 uh, children in uh, in Hebron, uh, mentioning. Yeah, Hebron. well, this this young man, he was he's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think 20, um, and he he's also from uh, El Khalil, from Hebron, yeah. and the the report, this yeah, the, what you're talking about was um, happened last week or. Yeah. The week before, um, 30 kids, children on their way to school. I mean, yeah. the pictures, you know, show clearly their, the boys had their backpacks on their backs, um, were, were arrested on their way to school. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, <clears throat> yeah. it's vulgar. It's yeah. completely vulgar watching that video. I mean, these boys, they're tiny. They're crying. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're peeing in their pants. They're yeah. frightened. They're terrified. Yeah. And, you know, this is ostensibly for the yeah. high crime of throwing stones. <clears throat> stones yeah. at soldiers who, you know, there would be no throw stones thrown if these soldiers would get out of their neighborhoods in the yeah. first place. What are they doing in their neighborhoods yeah. to begin yeah. with? That's true. You and know? Where, where is, I questioned, where is the uh, Palestinian security forces, or are they busy really protecting Israel, not our people? And our exactly. People. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a really good point, yeah. and, I, and I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. Yeah. you know. Yeah, uh, I just uh, like uh, to give you a l- last word because I know you have uh, you tight on time. But uh, if you could give our listeners last word and if you could touch on the role of the BDS movement, please. Um, I think the um, I think the BDS movement um, is a, is a it's a, for me it's a huge source of hope. Um, I it's it's a it's a it's an avenue for. The, the whole world to become engaged in the struggle um, because frankly we uh, you know we're people who are facing our own extinction I mean you look at the map and you see like where what remains to us is less than nine uh, percent of our historic homeland um, and um, it's really important at this point to uh, to isolate Israel I mean, not only is Israel wiping us off the map, but they're doing it in concert with the world's only remaining superpower. So, you know, what are we going to do alone um, against these, you know, incredible forces whose whose media has been, you know, extraordinarily successful in painting us as the the victimizers, you know, <laughs> painting us as the terrorists. So it's it's and then on top of that, you know, you add to it that that we also have to confront our own leadership. Um, so it's it, you know it seems like a monumental task. Um, I don't think it's um, I, I don't think our liberation is unachievable. Mm-hmm. I think that um, that we you know we are looking for international solidarity, and I think that the BDS movement is. Um, is a really effective and wonderful tool, um, not just um, not just to help Palestinians, but I think it's a way of of uniting uh, humanity of conscience, people of conscience who who, uh, and to demonstrate people power. I mean, this is not just this isn't important just for Palestinians. It's important for all of humanity yeah. to, um, to you know to have to to, to to develop these examples where human beings, where ordinary people from all over the world um, can accomplish ex- extraordinary things um, that seem completely impossible simply by, uh, you know, by, by coming together um, in, in such a way. So, you know, the umbrella of, of the boycott campaign mm-hmm. um, is, is, is moral um, yeah. and it's just. And it's and it's inclusive. So yeah, yeah, I, I'm. Uh, 
I'm a, I'm a, a major BDS supporter. <laughs> and uh, basically the demands are simple, you know, equality for Palestinians inside Israel, end of occupation, and uh, the return of the refugees. So it's all human rights and it's a non-violent uh, uh, action against uh, the Israeli oppression and, uh, and racism and apartheid, basically. Correct. Yeah. Thank you, really, uh, Susie, and it is a pleasure uh, to talk to you, and keep up the good work, and stay in touch. Thanks, Hannah. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, thanks. And that was Hana Kawas talking with Susan Abulhawa about the Janine refugee camp. And with that, we conclude another edition of The Voice of Palestine. I've been your co-host, Marian Kawas, and our final piece of music is by Jewish-American singer-songwriter David Rovix, entitled simply Janine. We condemn the international conspiracy of silence about the tragedy of the Palestinian people and call on all supporters to call their governments to account. Silence is complicity.
Thank you.